In this lecture, I'm going to be talking about maximum and minimum values. Um, a lot of our motivation for this section comes from optimization problems, which we'll be getting to a little bit later in Chapter 4, um, where we're going to be interested in finding the maximum or minimum value of um, some kind of function in a, in a context um, over some domain. Um, so the first thing that we need to look at is some definitions of what we mean by this absolute uh, maximum and minimum values. So if we're talking about um, a function f and we let c be a number in the domain d of our function, then we say that f of c is the absolute maximum value of our function on the domain if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain. Um, so this makes sense. So we've got something like this here where this is my c so that f of c is greater greater than um, the values of the function for all x over our domain. Um, we can also have something like this where maybe it's um, one of the endpoints here where this um, point here uh, would be my c and it would be greater than everything else in my domain. When I talk about the absolute minimum value of my function, I'm saying that that value needs to be less than all of my other function values um, over my whole domain. So I'm thinking about maybe something like this, um, where this is my c value here is the, the minimum over my whole domain. Or maybe I have something like this here, where this point again is my absolute um, minimum. So let's look at an example where we want to identify our maximum and minimum values. So we have two different graphs here. Um, so in the first one, if I'm looking for where my absolute maximum um, value is located, that looks like that's over here. This is the biggest y value. It's greater than all other y values of this function. So that's occurring at um, point s. And it looks like the absolute minimum value is occurring at r. Okay. Um, if I look at the second graph, it looks like my absolute maximum value um, is occurring at r. Okay. I think these are supposed to be connected. Let's say that there's a, just a sharp corner there. So at r, I've got an absolute maximum value. And I've got an absolute minimum value, it looks like, at a. It looks like over here, that's um, smaller than all of the other y values of my function. Um, but one thing that the absolute min and the absolute max doesn't account for is some of these, these other values here, which still seem somewhat special. They're not the biggest or the smallest over the whole interval, but they are bigger or smaller than everything near it. So that brings us to the next um, kind of extreme value that we're going to be interested in. And that is our local extremes. So um, we can talk about um, absolute extremes, absolute min and absolute maxes, like we were on the previous slide. Um, here we're looking at local extremes, local mins, and local maxes. Okay. So we call a number f of c our local max if um, that value is greater than or equal to all of our y values near the point that we're looking at. And we're going to have, let's see, that's our local max. We're going to have a local min if our value is less than all of our y values near our point. Um, so if we take one of the examples that we were looking at before, we said that we had this absolute max um, here at r, okay? And we had the absolute min at a, but what about our local mins and maxes? So here it looks like I've got a local min here at D, because near D, okay, and in, in, on a small uh, interval around D, that um, point F of D is smaller than everything nearby. So we've got this local min at point D, and it looks like we've got our local max also at R. So it's possible for um, an absolute max to also be a local max at the same time. Okay, so we want to look at some more um, examples dealing with our extreme values. So, you know, we've seen some examples where we had local mins, local maxes, and um, absolute mins and maxes. Um, but not all functions are going to have extreme values. So we're going to look at a couple situations where we might not, or just some other kinds of situations that might arise when we're looking at um, extreme values. So for example, if we consider the
the function y equals x cubed okay, over the interval from negative infinity to infinity over its whole domain, we notice that there are no absolute mins or maxes because we can always find a bigger value. And there's also no local mins or maxes. So there's no local extreme values on this um, function. Okay. What about something like the absolute value of x? Well, here we see that we do have a local min. So we've got a local min at um, x equals 0. Okay, And again, we're considering this absolute value function on its whole domain. Um, notice that that local min is also an absolute min. But if we're looking at this function over the whole domain from negative infinity to infinity, there's no absolute max, because we can always find something bigger. And there's no local max. Okay, So it's possible to have some extremes or neither extreme. Um, another situation that's possible is that we can have multiple locations of extreme values. So if we consider something like our sine function, I know that sine of 0 is 0, and then it's going to oscillate back and forth. I see I have multiple locations of um, local maxes, and that these are in fact also absolute maxes. So I know that sine can be as big as 1. So th all of these points here are both local maxes and absolute maxes. And I see that all of these various points here, and this would also keep going in the other direction as well, would be both local mins and absolute mins. Okay, So we see we can have a few different kinds of situations arise. This isn't all of them, but we see that sometimes we're going to have local extremes and sometimes we're not. And it also will be possible for um, us to have an extreme value that occurs at multiple locations. So we want to um, go into this a little bit further and say, OK, when well, we know that not all functions have these extreme values, but when is our function going to have an extreme value? So what are the properties that will make a function have an absolute min or an absolute max? So that brings us to what's called our extreme value theorem. So the extreme value theorem says that if our function is continuous on a closed interval, the function attains an absolute maximum value, some f of c, and an absolute minimum value, some f of d, at points over that interval. So the two conditions um, that will make our function have an absolute min and an absolute max are being continuous and being um, defined on a domain that's closed, or being defined over a closed interval. And we need both of these conditions. So if you remember when we had the example with y equals x cubed, this was on the interval from negative infinity to infinity, which is not closed. So although this was um, a continuous function, it wasn't over a closed interval. And so this theorem says, well, then it would not necessarily have an absolute min and max, which is, is what we found. Um, here's another situation. What if um, our function is not continuous? Then we can have the following. We can have something like where it's closed at this endpoint here, but maybe it has some kind of jump discontinuity. So here I've got an absolute min, looks like somewhere around here, but no absolute max. Because I can keep getting closer and closer to this point um, B here, but I'm always going to be able to find um, something that's a little bit bigger, because I'm never going to hit F of B. So I can't find one value that's bigger than all of the other y values, because I can always just make it a little bit bigger in, in the limit as I get closer and closer to where that hole is. So we see that if the function's not continuous, we're not necessarily going to have um, both an absolute min and an absolute max. And here's another example of what happens if the interval is not closed. So we can have situations like um, our y equals x cubed. We can also have something where maybe 
we have some kind of asymptotes. So I could have some function like this, right, where I've got a vertical asymptote as well as a horizontal asymptote, and here I have no absolute max and no absolute min. Okay. So the only times I'm going to be guaranteed to have an absolute min and an absolute max is if my function is both continuous and defined on a closed interval. Now this doesn't say that it's impossible if you have something that's not continuous or on a closed interval um, for it to have an absolute min or an absolute max. This just says that in order to be guaranteed that you have an absolute min and absolute max, your function needs to be both continuous and defined on a closed interval. Okay. So if we are in one of these situations we, and we know these absolute extremes exist, um, how are we going to find them? in general. How are we going to find the locations of these extreme values? So we have a couple of key ideas that are going to be related to this. So our first key idea says that if our function f has a local min or a local max at c, and if the derivative exists, then the derivative will be equal to zero. Okay, so this is um, maybe not quite in the form that we would like, but it's telling us that there's something important about where the derivative um, is equal to zero that's related to these locations of um, local extreme values. But we have to be a little bit careful here. This doesn't say that um, f prime of c equaling zero um, doesn't imply that we have a local min or max. So we can have uh, say here that we have to be careful because f prime of c equals zero does not necessarily mean f has a local extreme, either a min or a max, at c. Okay, because again, if we think about our y equals um, x cubed example, we know that y prime is equal to three x squared and that y prime is zero when x equals zero, okay? But there's no local min or max at x equals zero, okay? So this just says that if we have a local min or max, so if we're in some kind of situation like this where the derivative exists, then we know we're gonna have a horizontal tangent there and therefore our derivative is going to be zero. But just knowing that the derivative is zero doesn't necessarily mean we've got a local min or a local max. There are also other situations where we might have a local min or max that um, is not where the derivative equals zero. If we take our absolute value example again, we see that we have the local min at x equals zero but we know that f prime of zero in our absolute value function does not exist, so it's not a place where the derivative would be equal to zero. Okay. So this theorem is telling us something useful, but it's not in the maybe the most um, applicable format right away. But we're still seeing that there's something special about where the first derivative is zero and maybe where that first derivative does not exist. So that brings us to our second um, key idea that's going to be important in this section. So we've said that these numbers are special, where the derivative doesn't exist and where the derivative is equal to zero. What we call these numbers are critical numbers. So we say that a critical number of a function f is a number c in the domain of our function. So finding the domain is going to be an important first step, such that either the, the uh, first derivative at that point is zero or the first derivative at that point does not exist. And so what we say is that these critical points or these critical numbers are candidates for our extreme points. So there's going to be a second step where we then look at those candidates and determine which of them are actually extreme values. And we're going to talk about that next step um, in class. So for now, we'll just get some practice finding um, critical numbers. So if I wanted to find the critical numbers for the following function, where h of t is equal to t to the 3 fourths minus 2t to the 1 fourth, I know that I first need to be concerned about what the domain of my function is. And then I'm going to have to look at taking the derivative. So looking at this function, I see that I'm, I'm taking some even roots. So I've got a 3 fourths root and a 1 fourth root. So I'm going to need t to be greater than or equal to zero. Or in other words, I need the domain to be from zero to infinity. So in my next step, I need to go ahead and take the derivative. So I see that h prime of t is going to be 3 fourths 
t to the 3 fourths minus 1, which will be to the negative 1 fourth, minus 2 times 1 fourth t to the 1 fourth minus 1, which will be to the negative 3 fourths. So we have 3 over 4 t to the 1 fourth minus, let's see, 1 over, if we simplify this a little bit, we'll have 1 over 2 t to the 3 fourths. Okay. So now I have to see where is um, my derivative 0 and where does the derivative not exist? So where does um, h prime of t not exist? Well, looking at this, I know I need t to be positive, again, because I'm dealing with even roots. So th that means I'm, I'm working with just a subset of my domain. But even within that domain, I see that 0 would still be included and that 0 um, would be a place where this derivative does not exist. So when t equals 0, that's going to be one of our critical values because h prime of 0 does not exist. So what about where my derivative is equal to 0? So we need to set 3 over 4 t to the 1 fourth um, minus 1 over t, uh, 1 over 2 t to the 3 fourths equal to 0, which means we'll be setting these two things equal to each other. Okay since I would add this um, part to both sides. So we can cross multiply here. So we've got 6t to the 3 fourths equals 4t to the 1 fourth. Then I can look at dividing or maybe factoring. So I can make this 6t to the 3 fourths minus 4t to the 1 fourth equals 0. Um, and we can factor out a 2t to the 1 fourth. So that'll be times 3t to the 2 fourths minus 2 equals 0. So we see that this means either 2t to the 1 fourth is 0, or um, let's see, I'm going to have this 3 root t is going to be equal to 2. So that gives me either t is 0, or I'm going to have root t is equal to 2 thirds, or t is equal to 4 ninths. Um, I know that t equals 0 isn't a solution to the derivative being equal to 0, because I know I can't plug in 0 there. Okay, so that's not really a solution to where h prime is 0. But I see that my two critical numbers then are going to be where t equals 0 and where t is equal to 4 ninths. Okay, so if I had um, a closed interval that I was working with here, um, I could use my closed interval in these, these two points to help me figure out um, which of those values are going to actually be where an extreme um, point occurs. So we're going to talk more about how to use um, these critical numbers um, in class and how to test those candidates for um, extreme point locations. Um, please let me know if you have any questions.